I feel you need to get an income to put into property. And once you've gained that income, you, you secure it with wealth building assets from, from that. I think when people are teaching about property, they're doing it for their agenda to mm -hmm. keep people hooked. Whereas what you've just said is, is what I've said before is cash flow first. Like you, you can't live without cash flow. If, unless you're a builder, you've got transferable skills. Nobody should be going out on their first deal doing a commercial version if they've never even costed a job before. What, even if you can buy a commercial building like the one behind us for a pound? Exactly, yeah, <laughs> for one pound, using all other people's money. <laughs> the worst advice that anybody gives anybody and everybody gives is, look, I've done this, so, so can you. Yeah. And that's just absolute BS. Everybody's got different skills. I've just finished Usain Bolt's book, and no matter how much I trained, no matter how much mindset I had, no matter how much belief I had in myself, I'd never run under 10 seconds. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. So today I have the pleasure of welcoming Harvey. But before we jump into today's podcast, I'd like to say a big thank you to our sponsor, Casita Properties, the UK leading property company when it comes to off-market discrete buy-to-let sales. As usual, all the links will be in the description below. Harvey, pleasure to have you on the channel, mate. Thank you for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to jump into some uh, interesting topics. We're going to throw some twists and turns on things. Cool. But before we do, we're going to do the traditional, give us that intro to who you are and what you do. So who am I? I'm Harvey. I'm a remote property investor. So that means I live in the South. I was born not far from here in Stratford, but at the moment I live in Brentwood and I invest in the North East mainly, but for a couple of reasons. Number one, just the price driven. Uh, I started to invest up there for a price initially. But number two, my wife's from Holland and one of my whys and my my goals is to travel regular. So I've set my business up so I can run it from my phone from anywhere. So it allows me to invest in the north, anywhere in the country where I stick to one area although, uh, and just travel all the time. So I've been traveling monthly for the last seven years apart from in COVID, uh, so. Well, what I, wanna, what I wanna start with, and I always start with this question, uh, regardless of the business that, that people are involved in, why did you get into business, uh, which is also property, entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. What what made you go down that route instead of getting yourself a nine to five? Uh, I really, I really struggle with kind of authority. I think it is uh, really can't deal with that mundane. You've, I realise discipline is important in in business as well, and you've got to try to get into discipline routines. But my, again, I will talk about this a lot. My wife's living my terms. So I don't like knowing that I've got to be there on a Monday. If I want to go on holidays tomorrow, I go. We was in Legoland on Monday. It was absolutely mobbed. And I went, let's stay an extra day. So I could. I just moved a few things in my diary, uh, worked a little bit off my phone while I, while I was there, and we stayed an extra day. So, so yeah, I think the seed of that was that. All the jobs I've ever had only ever lasted for about three months. And I used to get skit an itch. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, I just can't deal with this, even if I didn't have anything else. But from really, really young, uh, like I, we was born in Stratford. We like my, I don't know my dad. Uh, was single mum. We 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 grew up in a council estate. Didn't have much money, so I was always in cute like curious around trying to make my own money and my own little hustles. From I remember the first sort of little hustle was BMX parts. So there's a film BMX Bandits when I was a kid. I'm 44 years old, so a lot, a lot of people will remember it. But it was a big film, and all the kids had BMXs. And I, I my mum bought me a bike, but it was terrible. And like bless her, it's like. Oh, what was it a diamond back it wasn't i got a diamond back through trading but it was a, a universal so there wasn't oh, yeah, the cool yeah. bikes like yeah so i remember going over to a boot market we used to get all our toys everything from like boot markets we used to go every sunday i used to go to my nan she used to buy books from there and uh you, what what happened is this guy he must have done a garage clearance or something but he had all these bike parts like diamond bike parts uh, harrow wheels and all these different uh array of wheels and skyway wheels and all these different small parts broken down but he didn't he didn't know what they was worth so he had them all on there for like 10p 50p and all, i knew these was all worth easy four five ten fifteen pound each so every week i was getting a bit of money <laughs> going to buy one part selling it the profit from that going back buying more multiple parts so yeah from early on i, I kind of had to figure out a bit dyslexic so I just always used to figure out if you do A, that will potentially give you B and let's give it a kind of try, you know? So Yeah. So you had that. It's funny you say about the itch. I think a lot of people who end up going on to do their own thing or want to work on their own timescale, stuff like that, they always talk about, well, I, I, I call it even like the light bulb moment or, you know, like you said, the itch where you can't almost sit still for someone else. So I think a lot of people can relate to that. So if you're getting the itch, it's probably because you want to do more. Um, why, why property? We were having a, just quickly, we were having a conversation off camera, we'll probably touch on it in a little bit, but... What led you into property originally? Uh, I, I can't, I, I get asked that question obviously a lot and I, I can't 
p- pinpoint the actual moment where I was like, right, this is definitely it, property. But I always had an interest. As I said, from young, like back in the day, when I first got into property, the internet wasn't quite the same as it is today. I wasn't even on the internet. And I, but it, from young, I used to get the Gazette and go through the property pages. I used to always buy the loot. We used to trade things via, via the loot, like uh, old newspaper. And yeah, I don't know. The first seeds started around then. And I wanted to get into it longer before I actually did and didn't. Things happened, circumstances happened. But, uh, but the thing I do like about property, it is quite a slow burner and we was having that debate around that just, be, just now. But the thing I do like about it is once it is set up, if you get it set up correctly, it is fairly passive. So the freedom that allows you, like, uh, uh, allows you with that and uh, I find... Yeah, I really like I really like that, and and the asset building, wealth building, generational wealth building with that. And again, when we was having that debate about businesses and property, the thing with businesses, a lot of them are pretty active instead of passive. Also, for a wealth building tool, your my son and my daughter, I've got son and daughter, and they might not be into business. I'm not going to force them into my businesses, mm. but I can leave them properties which are going to be an asset which I can protect and make sure they don't sell, which can be left on for generations and generations. Businesses are all down to how well they're run. Property, they've got to be managed, but you've got to go quite far wrong. If you've got a decent sized portfolio, you've got to go quite far wrong to not get no income from it, you know? So so is that stability? It's yeah. Like that, it's like that foundation, is it? I mean, bricks and mortar, isn't it? It's, Absolutely, yeah. Is for for any for anyone that's made like serious wealth, it is kind of that pump and dump where you can grow a net worth, like you say, it's mm-hmm. it's that income for generations. Yep. So yeah, totally agree. And I know many people that that get into property for the same reason. So there is that business side to it. Mm-hmm. Uh you said you, you hit the nail on the head about with a business, you've got to be active, you've got to be looking to grow it, you have got to be very much involved. But there's also that spin, isn't there, that actually a business now can have minimal overheads. You can set it up correctly. And also, I think what appeals to most people, and this is the conversation uh, to be had is, uh, and certainly one I've had a few times now, is that the startup capital sometimes can be trickier to get into property, especially now with inflation going up, like, you know, especially in the South, who can keep up Mm -hmm. with with, with a family house putting down a deposit. I mean, not many people. Whereas starting a business, you might not need too much capital. So what's... In the day and age that we're in now, what are your thoughts on someone trying to perhaps work out, do I go the business route? Do I go property? What's your thoughts? Yeah, that question of that. I'm actually a coach as well. And I say to people, if you can find somewhere we can monetize your money to build your property portfolio, that's going to be your fastest route in. Uh, property decision for me in 2009 was very different to a property decision what it is today yeah. because the market's really, really much more saturated today. The deals are harder to find. The, the banks are slightly different attitude towards property now. Uh, as you said, inflation, that's the main reason I remote invest, to be fair. It just don't work in the South. If it did work in the South, I wouldn't drive four hours every so often to an area where it did work sort of thing but uh, but even these other areas in the north I feel we've got a little window maybe five ten years maximum they're all going up and because of the digital age now jobs are going across the UK so people have got such a narrow mind because London performed really really well London had a 518% growth in a 20 year period from 1996 up to 2016 and that's never heard of, that's never happened before like before in the whole history but if you zoom out people have got like I, I study I like study in economics as well and I love a guy called Ray Dalio and he talks about long term and short term debt cycles he said when you zoom out most people look at the, the cycle what they can see in their recent history because it's linked to your emotions yeah. so everybody sees London grew so much so everybody's still riding off the back of the wave of oh, London for capital growth look at the data I say to people London's not really grown for the last six seven years the top capital growth places have been Liverpool and Manchester it's because infrastructure's coming into these areas so now that infrastructure's coming in uh, and jobs are coming in it's going back to pre World War One and Two, when we was the industrial revolutionary leaders of the world and the wealth distribution was even. We was making steam engines, there was steel in the north, coal in the north, and that wealth distribution was even. Then we lost, then what we fought the war, sorry, but when we lost the leading uh, economic status to America and they took the reserve currency, the world's leading superpower, and then it became a central business hub in London. But now the internet's out, the business is spreading out again, widely. And like, I know it's a long way to you answer your question, but going, if I start today, I wouldn't start with property, definitely not. I feel it's, it's too much of a slow burner. I feel you need to get an income to put into property. And once you've gained that income, you you secure it with wealth building assets from, from that. 
we will really relate to that, won't we, Paul? What you've just said, I, I would, I would back and second because this is it doesn't annoy me because that's the wrong word because um, that would take effort on my part. <laughs> but it is a case of, I think when people are teaching about property, they're doing it for their agenda to mm -hmm. keep people hooked. Whereas what you've just said is is what I've said before is cash flow first like you you can't live without cash flow you can generate a business i always use it i don't know why i use the example i think because i love coffee but you could take seven eight hundred pound buy a horse trailer take another five six hundred pound convert it into a coffee bar go let that out at wedding businesses food festivals you get two thousand three thousand people passing your coffee bar you make four or five hundred pound in a day you do that four or five days a week or whatever it might be you know just something to generate cash flow keep that coming in and then invest that cash instead of going i've got some savings i'm just going to pump and dump into property oh but it is a slow burner so you do have to make your decision based on times that are changing so really really like that in terms of your goals now when it comes to property and the reason i ask this question is so it gives a bit of perspective and reality your goals when you started in property to what they are now, how have that changed again? Because I'm asking that because of how much change has happened over these last few years and what's happening with the economy now and the markets. So people could listen to someone who's in amongst the market of, of property. What's, how have things changed for you now? Like, how do you look at property now? Yeah, great question. Uh, so yeah, it's massively shifted. When I first, the first deal I ever done was a piece of land. I thought I was going to build two, three bedroom properties on the on the land, and I thought I was going to be this big developer. My vision for that was like, okay, within five years' time, I'm going to be building blocks of 20, 30, 50 flats. And, and that was my vision. And this is what I say to people, I've got a thing what I call figuring out happy. And for me, figuring out happy is a lifelong quest because what makes you happy yesterday doesn't always make you happy tomorrow. And what makes you happy 10 years ago is very different. It's always evolving. Like so wh what you have to do is tune in to the ev evolve with that, you know, don't get stuck. Like this again, it, it bugs me as well. Some people say, ah, oh, London and the South are investing. I'm like, you, you start Rick, Ricky, funny enough, is one of them. He keeps on buying <laughs> these houses for like, I love Ricky as well. So it's definitely not a criticism of him, but he keeps on buying these houses for 400k because he's just, he just knows that. I said, there's a better way out there now. So, uh, for me, how I'd look at property now is, is remotely because I feel single let properties is what builds a foundation. They're not sexy, they're not exciting, they're not like, be financially free within one deal what sells courses. But reality is, I call it a property data matrix. Reality is you need a good foundation to build a good portfolio. You shouldn't be, nobody, if, unless you're a builder, you've got transferable skills. Nobody should be going out on their first deal doing a commercial conversion if they've never even costed a job before. Well, even if you can buy a commercial building like the one behind us for a pound? Exactly, yeah, <laughs> for one pound, using all other people's money. <laughs> Listen, I'm an advocate of using other people's money. I use other people's money, but I'm an advocate of figuring out where you are in your journey. You know, if you are, if you are out of shape, you don't go to the gym and do a hit workout and a, you'll injure yourself you do the relevant workout of what's relevant to you where you are in in what shape you're in but if you go to the gym and you're in pretty reasonable shape already like your target of getting fit and and doing what you're going to do would be quicker than somebody super out of shape doesn't mean you can't get in shape if you super, if you're super out of shape it just means you've got to take a different plan to it and different effort the worst advice that anybody gives anybody and everybody gives is look i've done this so, so can you yeah. and that's just absolute bs everybody's got different skills i've just finished usain bolt's book and no matter how much i trained no matter how much mindset i had no matter how much belief i had in myself i'd never run under 10 seconds mm -hmm. so i've not got the innate ability to do that you can't turn a a, a pig into a racehorse no matter how much you train it so you've got to find out where your strengths are what your goals are what your outside circumstances are so i say to people look it, well I, I sell courses but i say it's never going to sell me as many courses and i can live with that but do not take on a massive refurbishment like project if you if you don't know how to cost a, a job before start off and say it's small to cut your teeth build it up get the income from the Bread small stuff yeah but it's, it's just not sexy. It's not going to sell. It's it's, just, it's, I, I love this conversation because I'm going to tie this in with LinkedIn. We were talking off camera. We've spoken about this a few times. LinkedIn for me, Paul, other people, it's the bread and butter. It's not sexy. It's mm -hmm. not attractive. It's so boring. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing about LinkedIn that screams out sexy. Like, you know, let's use that word. There's, there's nothing about it like Instagram. Instagram's all photos, mm -hmm. colors, love hearts, you know, emojis. But LinkedIn is where the money is. Mm -hmm. Like if you know how to use LinkedIn, you can earn tens of thousands, if not 20,000 a month, mm -hmm. like that in all seriousness. Mm -hmm. But that is the bread and butter. The Instagram is the whole, that, that's the version of what you were just saying is yeah. that, you know, everyone wants to go straight for the commercial because some guy who's 
popped up on a screen saying you can buy a commercial for a pound. Everyone's like, well, I've got a pound. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm, I'm doing that. So bread and butter, like you say, even if it's not exciting, it's about, I think you earn more credibility when you don't flitter from one thing to the other. Yeah. Especially if you're trying, everyone's selling at the end of the day. And if we were going to invest with you or you were going to invest in someone else and someone was saying, last week I did this, now I'm doing this, now I'm doing rent to rent, now I'm doing commercial, now I'm doing a big, you don't know where someone sits. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So like you say, I like, you, you know, bread and butter, single lets, get it right. And then look to grow organically from there, right? Yeah, build on that. I call it, like I say, it's, look at the bottom. Look, say I call it the property delta matrix. At the bottom, have a look. Build some foundational stuff. Family homes is the stuff that gives you the regular income. The only other thing more passive than that is social housing. But then you step up to HMOs and SAs. They're more complex. They give you more money for a reason because they're more complex. There's more, more to them. More to renovating them. More to financing them. More to managing them. So step up when you've got the income coming from the single lets underneath to support that. But also a little bit of skill to renovate a. Commercial Commercial, like I've just done a, a HMO and we're getting a commercial valuation. To get that, you have to go all on suites. You have to go like, turn it into something that's not a house. And you have to spend best part of 70 grand upwards to, to be able to achieve that. And 70 grand is if you really know what you're doing. Realistically, 100, 150K. To navigate that, you, you need to know what you're doing really, you know? And if you, if you get that wrong, especially with other people's money, you could jump, like my, my estimates for this, I've done hundreds of refurbs and my estimate for this was about 70 to 85K. I'm, now, I'm into this for close to 100K. But the reason I can live with that is because straight away I just knew from day dot, things change. There was a few things that changed with planning. Secondly, I've got a f foundation of income coming in. I've had headaches with the builder because he took on too many jobs, so it took longer, but I've still got a foundation of money coming in from underneath. If this is my first deal, my only deal, and all my money in on this, this could have bankrupted me because where would I raise this extra 20 odd yeah. K to finish a deal, you know? So how important has it been for you to convert onto video on social media? and let people know who Harvey is because you're always on the camera as well. And we, we, we talk about this all the time with all guests off camera, just in general, that photos are dying. No one wants to read a boring old quote, but video, you get to know someone, who they are, what they're saying, if you agree with it, whether you disagree with it. How important has that been for you? And also, has that helped you raise finance? Like, have, have people, have you allowed people to trust you through video? Yeah, uh Great, great question, and uh, I can't emphasize this enough. It's the single most important thing you can do in any business today, without a question of a doubt. If you want to grow a business quicker, you do that. You can grow a business without social media, without a question of a doubt, but you'll just slow your pace. If your pace, and everybody's got a different pace. Like I said, Usain Bolt can run at 9.57 seconds. Somebody else can run slightly slower than him. Everybody's got their pace. So wherever your pace is, if you want to increase that, add social media to it, and definitely video. Video, people get to know you. At the moment, short-form video is where it's at because everybody's attention is getting shorter and shorter so hard uh, always uh, that's how we first reached out wasn't it like I love your channel and I'm like YouTube is the hardest one and it's like wow like this deserves a hell of a lot it's doing well as well so it's no yeah, yeah. discredit but it's, it's tough, also it? yeah it's also a compliment at the same time like it's like wow you're doing everything absolutely bang on right with this channel editing's great the the guests are good the, of course the guests are good but the, <laughs> the editing's great the guests are good the, the content's good like yeah, sponsors are good. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting it bang on, but it's hard It's hard to get that momentum on it. So short form yeah. videos, if you want to get that first momentum, they're like your pipeline, your funnel, and people will filter through onto your longer form stuff. Maybe not give as much time on there, but it's absolutely critical. I've just raised 100K the other day purely for my content. Somebody suggested to me, I've, I've got some money, what should I do with it? You could potentially do this. Do you want my money? No, well, no, I've got nothing sitting on the table at the moment. Uh, and then literally two days later, a block of six flats turned up. I was like, oh, they said that. that that's there. Yeah, let's go for it. The yeah. guest house got at the moment raised private finance for it. But again, people hear this, it sounds sexy. It took a lot of years and graft to get to that point. I didn't just turn up and do one video and all of a sudden people were just offering me money. It took a, a bit of consistency. But I hated social media when I started it. Really didn't want to do it. I was in and out of trouble when I was a kid as well a little bit. And I thought, well, the last thing I want to do is plaster my face mm. in the limelight across everybody. I also thought my mates would banter me. And <laughs> yeah, I went and done some training in Bali with a guy called Roger Hamilton, done a two-week entrepreneur course with him. And uh, it's day four, I went, right, tomorrow you're doing videos. And I was like, I don't want to do that. Uh, but I was out. I was in that environment and it was too embarrassing not. And I, I'd done nearly 40 takes trying to just make one video. Went there the next day, done about 10 takes trying to make the video. It was terrible. The guy was just like, yeah, just keep on practicing. <laughs> like, and I come away saying, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to do it. It improves on your public speaking, your sales, everything. Uh, yeah. Do you know what's really funny as well is 
this is what we were saying. It's like the compound effect. You have to be on video. It might not pay today, yeah. But being on the promos, being on these, you know, these montages that that allow you to get out there because it builds trust. Like, and what was it Simon said earlier about rapid growth? Go. Um, he said rapid growth, rapid education, and he said something else. But basically, we had Simon Leslie on earlier, who's who run um, Inc, an international company for all the airlines, mm -hmm. and he said you go quick, you go quick on the growth, you go quick on your education. And it's like, if there's a quick, like you say, if there's a quicker way to grow and allow people to get to know you, to then make an informed business decision or collaboration or synergy between the two, why would you still keep typing posts, mm -hmm. spending spending 45 minutes writing a carousel when you can literally pick up the phone and be like, look, this is who I am. This is the value that I add. This is what mm -hmm. I'm able to offer. And you're and you'll grow. So it's keeping up with the times. Gary V, I sent Paul um, a clip earlier. I'll send it to you as well. The two biggest platforms right now to be on, if you merge the two together and you marry them up, are TikTok and LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Merge the two. TikTok exposure, LinkedIn the business, sell it. Mm -hmm. um, it's what I'm on. It's what I'm doing. And it works. So um, loving this conversation, by the way, because it's, it's, it's very aligned on, on what I believe. So when it comes to social media, because it is hard work, like you just touched on, no, what I don't think anyone really wants to. I don't even like calling it social media because I think it's quite vain. I like to call it like my business homepages. Yeah, like a touch point for mm -hmm. who I am. How do you find balancing it? Because waking up every morning, doing the stories, doing the post it is tiring, isn't it? So what keeps you going? Yeah, it does give you some fatigue, and I and I dip in. So with anything, whether it's social media, whether it's staying fit, whether it's business, I have default modes because you can't be beast mode all the time. Right. So you need a default of. What is a, such a low, low embarrassing level to keep consistent? Because consistency outperforms hard work, like, like volume in short spurts without a shadow of doubt. So if you can learn a way to keep that consistent, that's when you're going to get results. And you need to do it in, the, like I say to people, start riding in the Tour de France. The test of you is not when you're riding down the hill, the sun's out, the wind's behind you, your tyres are fully pumped up. It's when you've got a bit of a slow puncher, you're riding up the hill and the wind's in your face and it's raining. That's the test of how you can keep on going. And you've got to then pace yourself because if you try and pedal at the same pace you did when you're riding down the hill with the wind behind you, you're going to burn out and you're going to just stop. So you've got to find them default modes where you sort of ah so for me how I do that is worst case this is what I try and say to people especially when I coach them because I say this is the key most important thing you can do it's just even if you just share something just just be present so you're still there yes creating content which is organic and you all the time is much better but on them days when I do get a bit of fatigue I try to aim at look I, I bought into that TikTok without a shadow of that short form videos is the most powerful thing for me, barring none. The thing in the past with content was, is the uh, main reason my YouTube didn't work is live videos suited me, suited my style of content because I could just get on and talk. So live was good, but I was literally just repurposing them straight onto YouTube. You need to edit them. You need to get them call to actions. You need to cut out all these bits. You need to get a fay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so... It didn't work on there. You couldn't really put them on Instagram either. The great and exciting thing I've got with TikTok videos is them short form videos are work, working on Instagram, Reels, uh, TikTok, TikTok, uh, and Facebook now. So even if Facebook groups got it's got the Reels section in there. Mark Zuckerberg said TikTok is the biggest threat to my business. Like he come out publicly and said that and then just publicly ripped off TikTok and then give tons and tons and tons of reach on on the short form videos so so yeah i think that's the most powerful thing if you can create short form videos first of all and then filter, filter it out from from there into the longer form stuff but again they're, they're not they're, like on the days i don't fancy recording something i might just get a picture of a house and just put a quote over top of it but on a video not on a quote anymore yeah. on a carousel you know so just find that default mode which you you can't convince yourself to not do i do exactly the same on those days where i just think i can't be bothered to post i think just add a tip, add a bit of value, mm -hmm. or if I've got some old TikTok videos, because you know yep. when you when you upload onto TikTok, it saves onto your phone. And I think, mm -hmm. okay, look, I've stuck one on LinkedIn yet. Yeah, I haven't. And one thing I find with LinkedIn, we were talking about this off camera, is LinkedIn back in the day. I've been on LinkedIn just over seven years now. A long time ago, it would almost be so taboo and so frowned upon if you were to put up a photo with an emoji on it or something. <laughs> you know, people, yep. this is a business platform. You should be writing articles and <laughs> links and, you know, it should be all uh, politics. And But now, you know, you can appeal to multimillionaires who are so cash rich, who can watch you for weeks, if needed, months, if not over a year, and eventually reach out to you and go, 
I've been watching you. I like what you say. And I'm a CEO of a company of 60 million a year. I'd like to back you on your deals. That happens. Mm -hmm. It happens. I'm living proof of it. Mm -hmm. Paul's living proof. It happens. It happens. And it's on LinkedIn and, and things have a cha have changed and things are evolving. But what I really like, and you'll have this as well, I've seen your YouTube, I've seen all your, your socials, is that I'm such a big believer in if you want to, and this is the next question, is moving on to domination of your industry to really take over with your brand and your business is having multiple touch points. And, and as an example, what I talk about is if you were to write your name in the middle, so you've got Harvey, how many touch points or landing pages can people validate who you are? Have you got the newsletter? You've got the training, you've got the YouTube, you've got the TikTok, you've got the Instagram, you've got your website. Like there's so much confirming who you are and that you're the guy for the job. Um, so it goes back to that. We've all got to be on social media. It doesn't pay straight away. Um, but you do have to kind of dominate and stand out from the crowd, don't you, to get the business? Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, and and for me, though, the advice for people is that's where I feel people get overwhelmed. They think I need every single channel and I try and do every single channel at once. I think just concentrate on just getting used to doing one platform, first of all, then slowly spread it across them. But uh, Google done a study. We started, I read it in Influence, the book Influence, and he said there's seven touch points before anybody gets trust in you. Mm. Uh, Google done a study about seven, eight years ago, so I feel this has changed because they've not redone really it. He called it Zermot, Zero Moment of Truth. And this is the point of when somebody builds enough trust in you to do business with you or buy from you or just build that yeah. enough touch. So then they say it's now more like 12 touch points instead of seven because of social media. It's good as social media is, it's made a lot more people wary of scams also. So you've got to put that little bit more effort in. So they say it's 12 touch points. And I say to people, look, people come to me and say, I've been following your content for this many amount of time. Here's business, here's cash, here's deals. Every single day in my inboxes, I've got opportunity of business. It didn't happen overnight as well though. This is this is what people get frustrated. They do one video and, and if you don't get a thousand views and and 20 likes and business of that one video they're like oh this don't work kind of thing and it's pointless yeah and they've just they've just got to stay with it and persevere unfortunately but well harvey i've really enjoyed this conversation before we do wrap it up have you got anything like a book recommendation something that's been impactful in your life that you could share with the audience like go away and check out so since we're talking about uh digital stuff uh Click uh, Russell Brunson stuff. Uh, so the traffic secrets, dot com secrets, expert secrets. Them three books is probably I, I spent. I read and listened to about hundred books per year for about six years. Wow. So I really dived into books and. Uh, they're the most impactful books I've must ever be done. A quick reader. No, very slow. <laughs> Funny enough, I've done a Jim, Jim Quick. It's not even a, a, a pun. Jim Quick's got a speed reading <laughs> course, and I've done his course. He works with people like Will Smith and big you people. can't say that with a pun. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, he, I've done his speed reading course, and my reading speed was 110 words per minute. The average person reads about 250 words per minute when I started it because uh, I'm a little bit dyslexic. But this is what I say to people, it's prioritization. Where I traveled a lot as well, that's before kids. Traveled a lot, so traveling, I read about 30 odd books a year and I used to listen to the books on times two, times three speed. So say, what about Audible? Audible yeah, Audible, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So about 70 books a year on Audible and about 20, 30 uh, uh, reading. You've made me feel really bad because I do about 18 books a year. <laughs> um, and I thought that was good, but no, I think... Most important thing is, no matter how many books you do, is just keep learning. It's, Absolutely, it's yeah. the point of when you stop, it it can all go terribly wrong. So, Harvey, it's been an absolute pleasure. Where can people reach out and connect with you, mate? Harvey Grove Properties, you'll find me on pretty much any platform. Uh, Instagram, if you want to message me, Instagram's probably your best place to message me and connect with me because I'm probably more active on the messenger there. But yeah, all the platforms you can pretty much pick me up on. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, mate. And everyone who's watched, uh, we will see you all very soon.